Have you ever lain awake at night wondering why there is a stone in Leytonstone? Well, in this video, I'm going to take you to the stone that put the stone into Leytonstone. And that's not all, for I'm also going to tell you about an 18th century highwayman who ended up rotting in chains alongside it. And on the way to the site of his posthumous ignominy, I'm going to introduce you to a venerable old coaching inn outside which legendary highwayman Dick Turpin committed one of his most audacious crimes. I can't wait! So let's head out to the far eastern border of London to the very busy Green Man Interchange, formerly known as the Green Man Roundabout and still commonly referred to as such by the locals. It is around here that Epping Forest begins, a fact attested to by a sign on a verge by a side road off one of the exits of the Green Man Roundabout. For centuries, commoners were allowed to graze their cattle in the forest, a right they enjoyed until the mid-1990s when mad cow disease and a subsequent foot and mouth outbreak led to the suspension of the ancient concession. In the 18th century, the roads and footpaths through the forest were lonely thoroughfares, and those who traversed them faced the ever-lurking threat that at any moment a highwayman or a footpad might emerge from the dense woodland, order them to stand and deliver, or words to that effect, and having relieved them of their money and possessions, retreat back into the leafy depths of the forest. Although anyone could find themselves the victim of these gentlemen of the road, their most popular target was the mail. This was likely to contain money as opposed to traceable jewellery and other valuables, and astonishingly the mails were often carried by solitary postboys who, despite the fact that they travelled fast, were nonetheless easy prey for the dastardly brigands who infested the remote roads along which the postboys galloped carrying their precious cargoes of correspondence and banknotes. As the Newgate calendar commented, it is now matter of surprise to reflect that such vast property as always has been remitted by post letters should have been so insecurely guarded in its conveyance. A lad with the mail behind him often carried thousands of pounds through lonely roads in the dead hour of the night. Hence, where there could be no resistance, every lurking cowardly thief was able to take the mail at his pleasure. The hamlet of Leytonstone, being on the edge of the forest, was seen by many wayfarers and postboys as offering a degree of safety from the unwelcome attentions of the highwaymen, and many a bygone traveller must have breathed a sigh of relief as they approached the hamlet. However, it was a false sense of security, for Leytonstone's location also made it a perfect base for the outlaws, and in consequence many hold-ups took place on the forest roads around it. The most famous highwayman to commit a robbery around here was Dick Turpin, who, on the 30th of April, 1737, along with his two accomplices, Matthew King and Stephen Potter, held up Joseph Major, just 40 yards from the Green Man Inn, a 17th-century coaching inn which sat on the main route from London to Ongar, Cambridge, Newmarket and Norwich, and which gave its name to the Green Man Roundabout. The Green Man still stands alongside the interchange, albeit the current building dates only from the 1920s, and its name has now been changed to O'Neill's, which doesn't really have the same ring to it. Having relieved Mr Major of a knife, a horsewhip, and seven or eight pounds in gold and silver, the outlaws also took a fancy to his horse, whose name was White Stockings, on account of the distinctive white bands on the feet of its hind legs, and soon the three highway robbers were riding off into the distance, one of them astride white stockings. Major reported the theft to Richard Bays, the landlord of the Green Man, and Bays later managed to trace the horse to the Red Lion Inn in Whitechapel, where he attempted to apprehend Matthew King, and in the course of a subsequent struggle, Turpin accidentally shot King, causing injuries from which King later died. Turpin himself escaped back to their hideout, a cave in Epping Forest, where he was spotted by Thomas Morris, the servant of one of the forest keepers, whom Turpin proceeded to shoot dead. Shortly thereafter, Turpin headed north to Yorkshire, 
where he was eventually captured, and on the 7th of April, 1739, he was executed in York. Richard Bays, the landlord of the Green Man, wasted no time in cashing in on the infamy that Turpin's execution had afforded him, and he quickly put out the genuine history of the life of Richard Turpin, a mixture of fact and fiction which helped create the legend of Dick Turpin. Of course, Turpin was just one of numerous highwaymen who infested Epping Forest in the 18th century, although most of them have now been eclipsed by his posthumous fame, and whereas his name is known the world over, most of theirs have long since been forgotten. But we do know a little about the escapades of one of them, and to begin his story we're going to continue past the Green Man roundabout and pause at a nondescript junction at which the road divides, the left fork heading towards South Woodford and the right fork heading for Wanstead, Snesbrook and Chigwell. On the pavement between the two roads there stands a weather-beaten monolith. It doesn't look anything special. Indeed, most people who pass it don't bother to give it a first, let alone a second glance. But it is special, very special indeed, for this is the high stone from which the hamlet of Leytonstone derives its name, the literal meaning of which is that part of Leighton that is by the stone. So this is the stone that put the stone into Leighton Stone. There has been a high stone at or close to this location since at least the early 18th century, possibly before, although the earliest known record of it is on a map that was drawn up for the Middlesex and Essex Turnpike Trust in 1728. During the 18th century, it became known as the Obelisk on account of its having been remodelled in that form. Sadly, the original obelisk was hit by a vehicle in 1933 and, in consequence of the damage done, the upper shaft had to be replaced. However, the base of its predecessor still remains and on closer inspection it looks far older than the 18th century, which has led to the suggestion that it might even be Roman in origin. But of course there's no way of proving its age, so let's just agree that it is of ancient origin and leave it at that. The high stone was a mile marker, on three faces of which were displayed the distances to Epping, Ongar, Whitechapel and Hyde Park Corner. You can still just about make out the lettering on two of the faces, although reading what it actually says is none too easy. To Ongar, 15 miles through Woodford Bridge, Chigwell, Abridge, states the faded inscription on the one side you actually can read, and lest viewers be impressed by my dedication in straining my eyes to decrypt the time-worn letters, let me here and now confess that, thankfully, there is a useful information board that saved me the trouble. It was put here in 2013, when the obelisk was restored, and it spares inquisitive wayfarers the onerous task of deciphering the inscription for themselves. There is even a photograph of the original obelisk for those who might be a tad curious as to what it actually looked like, which, to be honest, isn't that much different to what it looks like today. In fact, if I was the local council, I'd just lie and tell people that it is the original 18th century high stone and have done. Speaking of photographs, this postcard shows the high stone before the accident at a time when it evidently enjoyed a far more rural setting than it does today. I wonder if those two cyclists are in fact rascally highwaymen who are lying in wait for some unsuspecting victim and are merely posing as cyclists to throw him off his guard. Maybe not. Anyway, the important thing is that we have now established that this solitary monolith is the stone that put the stone into Leighton Stone, which makes it all the more galling that Thanks to a boundary change, it's not actually in Leighton Stone anymore, but rather, as you can see from the sign behind it, it's in the London Borough of Redbridge. One can't help wondering why they haven't renamed said borough Redbridge Stone. I mean, it makes sense if you think about it. Or have I just had too much coffee? But let's get to the story of the other highwayman associated with this vicinity, 
the one who ended up in chains alongside the historic landmark. First off, I should mention the fact that the roads hereabouts don't just go to Snaresbrook, Wanstead, South Woodford and Chigwell. No siree! Historically, they were extremely important roads that were once part of the main London to, amongst other places, Norwich Road, which is the reason why, at around four o'clock on the morning of Monday the 21st of March, 1757, a postboy bringing the Norwich Mail from Epping to the General Post Office in London happened to be galloping this way, carrying a portmanteau into which were crammed 17 bags of mail. According to that week's edition of the Kentish Post, as he approached the obelisk or high stone near Leytonstone in the county of Essex, he was stopped by a single highwayman on horseback. The highwayman presented a pistol to the postboy, at the same time ordering him to deliver him the mail, otherwise he would blow his brains out, which obliged the postboy to unstrap the mail and deliver it to the highwayman, who took the whole Norwich mail before him up on his horse and rode away with it full speed towards Epping. The man who committed this robbery, the paper continued, is described to be a mid-sized man and had on a white or very light-coloured riding coat with a plain hat. He rode a brown or very dark-coloured little horse with a swish tail. However, according to the Sussex Advertiser, in its edition of Monday the 28th of March, 1757, although the highwayman may have initially rode off towards Epping, it's supposed he turned and made towards London, and yesterday, about noon, the portmanteau, in which 17 bags of mail had been enclosed, was brought to the general post office. It was found in a farmer's grounds at Walthamstow. Thereafter, the trail went cold, and it seemed that the highwayman had gotten away with his villainous act. But then, in July, the Derby Mercury reported that We hear that a few days ago, Matthew Snatt, sometime since a baker at Lewis in Sussex, and afterwards a baker in Holborn, paid to Mr. Strudwick, a shopkeeper in Croydon, a banknote of £50, which proves to have been taken out of the Norwich Mail, which was robbed on the 21st of March last by the obelisk or high stone near Leytonstone in the county of Essex, for which he was apprehended on Monday last and examined by Sir Nicholas Hackett Carew, and the next day was by him and Samuel Atkinson, Esquire, of Croydon, committed to the new jail, Southwark. On Saturday the 4th of July, Snatt appeared before John Fielding, the magistrate at Bow Street Court, where, according to the Derby Mercury, he continued for some hours obstinate and hardened beyond all degree of comparison, but at length, finding the evidence against him grow stronger and stronger, and that his false and evasive answers would bring his innocent family into distress on his account, he opened and ingenuously acknowledged the fact, and behaved with penitence, becoming his unhappy situation. He was committed to Newgate by the above magistrate, and the parties bound over to prosecute. However, when on Tuesday the 2nd of August, Snatt appeared before the Lord Chief Justice Mansfield at the Chelmsford Assizes, he once again refused to plead. Mansfield was having none of it, and according to the Kentish Post, Lord Chief Justice Mansfield was obliged to give orders to the jailkeeper to take him away and let him be pressed gradually with weights till he agreed to plead, otherwise in that manner to press him to death, which is the punishment the law appoints for those that will not plead. On hearing this, Snat had a change of heart, and he pleaded not guilty, and was there and then put on trial. Having nothing to say in his defence, he was found guilty, and Lord Chief Justice Mansfield sentenced him to death. In addition, he gave orders that, following his execution, Snat's body was to be hung in chains at Leytonstone by the obelisk at which he had committed the robbery. The Derby Mercury, in its edition of Friday the 12th to Friday the 19th of August, reported that Last Saturday morning, the body of Matthew Snatt, who was executed the day before at Chelmsford for robbing the Norwich Mail, was brought from thence and hanged in chains near the Eleven Mile Stone on Epping Forest.
And thus the life of Matthew Snatt drew to an inglorious close, and travellers on what was then a lonely stretch of rutted road would find themselves confronted by the sight of his rotting corpse swinging in chains by the high stone, where it was intended to serve as a deterrent to any other villainous scoundrel who might be contemplating robbing the mail. Today the setting has changed considerably, and it's safe to say that those long-ago wayfarers would have difficulty recognising the neighbourhood were they to return to it, although they would probably recognise the high stone. It stands as a sullen reminder of the vicinity's distant, turbulent and violent past, and although it's been moved several times over the years, it's never moved that far from its original position. The sad thing is that most people who pass it fail to even notice it. Mail trucks and postal vans thunder past, their drivers oblivious to how dangerous this locality would have been for their predecessors in an age when robbing the mail was seen as easy pickings by the criminal fraternity. Pedestrians simply walk on by. Joggers encircle it, puffing and panting, as they wait for the green man of the pedestrian crossing alongside it to grant them safe passage over the road to Leighton Flats whilst the drivers of the cars that pass it are more intent on getting through the traffic lights before they turn red than they are on contemplating the genuine piece of local history that they are speeding past. But for those who do bother to pause and check it out, the High Stone offers a few moments of genuine fascination as they learn about its colourful past and of the vital role it played in shaping the history of the area around it. A history that encompasses galloping postboys and dastardly highwaymen, opportunist publicans and Roman legions. But above all else, they will discover the answer to an age-old conundrum that has probably been giving them sleepless nights for years. Where is the stone that put the stone into Leighton Stone?